flaming inferno, result of the collision of an underway, fully laden container vessel with an anchored, loaded crude oil tanker, occurred shortly after midnight on June 2nd, 1973, in New York Harbor. A Marine Board of Investigation was convened by the Commandant of the Coast Guard to investigate this tragic accident, which resulted in the death of 16 crewmen and constructive total loss of both vessels. The report of this board fully documents the probable cause and the circumstances following the collision. Extraordinary film from the New York City Fire Department, television stations, and other sources provide a valuable record of the progress and aftermath of the massive fire. From this material, we have attempted to reconstruct the events which occurred and to show their effect on the Port of New York, the stricken vessels themselves, and to pay tribute to heroic crews of the municipal fireboats, commercial tugs, and private craft who saved 40 crewmen from the burning vessels and who undoubtedly prevented far greater loss of life and property. Let's start by visualizing the circumstances leading up to the collision. On the night of 1 June 1973, the SS CV Seawitch, a United States registered 18,000 gross ton container vessel, was outbound from Howland Hook Container Terminal, Staten Island. The SS SO Brussels, a 700 foot, 26,000 gross ton Belgian tanker, loaded with about 300,000 barrels of Nigerian crude oil, and several other vessels were anchored off the Staten Island shore. The night was clear and visibility good. Tugs attending the Sea Witch had been dismissed in the vicinity of St. George. With a harbor pilot aboard, the vessel was proceeding in the vicinity of buoy 22 at about 13 knots and steadying on a course to pass under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. At about 12.37 a.m., the helmsman reported having steering difficulty. As the Sea Witch began to swing toward the Staten Island shore, the master attempted to shift steering systems at the bridge steering console, but this proved unsuccessful. The container vessel, in an uncontrolled swing, barely missed colliding with a tug and tow. The pilot attempted to slow the advance of the Sea Witch by use of the anchors and reversing the engine. The efforts were unsuccessful, and collision occurred at about 12.42. Upon impact, the bow of the Sea Witch penetrated the starboard side of the Brussels just aft of the amidships house into number seven starboard cargo tank. The angle of impact was about 60 degrees. The bow of the Sea Witch collapsed the bulkhead which separated number seven and eight starboard tanks and also entered number eight center tank. The boundary of number seven center tank remained intact. The force of impact provided the source of ignition for the 31,000 barrels of volatile Nigerian crude oil, which flowed out of the ruptured hull and spread on the surface of the water. A heavy concentration of crude oil became trapped between the ships. Influenced by a strong two and a half knot ebb current, and an eight knot westerly wind, the two ships, now locked together, began to drag the single anchor of the Brussels and drift toward the Verrazano Bridge. According to witnesses, flames were observed spreading on the starboard side of both vessels within 30 seconds after impact. Within a couple of minutes, Fire spread around the bow of the Brussels. The engine room of the Brussels filled with smoke, and the crewmen on watch had to abandon the space. The bridge watch, stationed in the amidship deckhouse, attempted to launch the forward port lifeboat. But as flames on the water approached, they abandoned this attempt, and with other crew members in the forward deckhouse, ran aft and joined crewmen at the port after lifeboat. When the boat was waterborne, an effort was made to start the hand-cranked diesel engine. But it did not start, 
and the crew attempted to push the boat away from the side of the vessel. As flames approached, several crew members leaped into the water. Some swam to safety and were rescued by vessels in the vicinity of the Verrazano Bridge abutment. The master and 11 crewmen of the Brussels perished in their attempt to abandon the burning vessel. On the Sea Witch, crewmen on the bow, on the bridge, and in the forward deck house ran aft and took shelter in the after deck house as flames spread on the water. Within minutes after the collision, the engine room of the container vessel filled with dense smoke and the space had to be abandoned. But prior to leaving the engine room, personnel started the emergency fire pump, which operates off the emergency power system. Several of the Sea Witch crewmen leaped overboard and swam to safety outside the perimeter of the spreading flames. They were rescued by commercial tugs and other vessels which had rushed to the scene. Radiating heat from the fire ignited containers on the deck of the Sea Witch. Fire spread rapidly and within a half hour after the collision had created a flaming mass which thwarted the attempt to launch the Sea Witch's port lifeboat. Many of the crew took temporary shelter below the main deck in the vicinity of the after storeroom and steering gear room. But as these areas filled with dense smoke, they were forced to make their way up to the main deck and return to the after deck house. As the heat intensified on the upper and lower decks, the crew congregated in the passageways on the main deck. As the after deck house filled with dense smoke, crew members attempted to cool the port side exit doors with fire hoses. Effective fire main pressure was lost in about an hour, probably due to fire hydrants being left open when hoses were abandoned. Despite the severe heat, Crewmen and the pilot were able to make their way to the weather deck during a break in the smoke and flames to attract attention in hope of rescue. The New York City fireboats, using high pressure monitors, were successful in reducing the deck fire on the Brussels and to some degree the deck fire aboard the Sea Witch. About an hour after the impact, the crew of the fireboat Firefighter observed the glow of a flashlight on the after port side of the Sea Witch. The firefighter went along the port side and placed two ladders to the main deck. Thirty crewmen and the pilot, using ladders and a fire hose secured to the rail, descended to safety and lowered the body of the master, who had died of a heart attack before the rescue. The survivors were taken to hospitals in Brooklyn and Staten Island. About an hour after the dramatic rescue of the 31 men, as several tugs were assisting in firefighting operations at the stern of the Sea Witch, a crewman of the tug, Brian McAllister, saw a face in a porthole on the upper deck. A ladder was placed to the upper deck. Three crew members of the tug went aboard the burning Sea Witch, broke the porthole glass, and rescued the ship's electrician from the emergency generator room. In all, 32 survivors were rescued from the water, 11 of whom were picked up by the tug Grace McAllister. The deck fire on the Brussels was brought under control quickly, but the fire in the deck houses continued for several hours. After most of the cargo in the ruptured tanks was displaced by seawater, the flames on the water broke up into patches and burned themselves out about an hour and a half after the impact. Coast Guard and fire officials were concerned about the nature and location of hazardous materials on board the Sea Witch. The ship's copy of the dangerous cargo manifest had been destroyed in the bridge wheelhouse fire. However, the vessel's owners were able to provide a copy of the manifest soon after the collision. 
the manifest indicated that the small quantity of hazardous material on board was widely scattered. Effective control of the shipboard fires was mainly due to the efforts of five New York fireboats and the assistance of a score of commercial tugs fitted with fire monitors. The two vessels had drifted and grounded about two miles below the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And the fires in the deck containers were controlled in about six hours. At dawn, the vessels were separated by commercial tugs and the sea witch was moved to a nearby anchorage. Loose water in the holds caused the ship to list. Application of firefighting water was reduced to a minimum to prevent further loss of stability. This allowed some deck containers to smolder and flare up for about two weeks. Fire in number two and number three holds also continued to smolder for several days. Viewed from a distance, the Brussels did not appear to have suffered the ravages of a major fire. Only upon closer examination did the twisted, distorted metal sculpture of lifeboats, cargo piping, melted aluminum grating, cargo tank valve wheels and stems, and crazed porthole lights reveal the effects of the intense heat. The steel boundaries of the cargo tanks, except those damaged by the impact, remained intact. The bulk of the remaining cargo was not involved, except for the vapors which escaped through vents, damaged piping, tank fittings, and burned above the main deck. After the fire was extinguished, the disrupted cargo tank covers and piping on the Brussels were made effectively tight with asbestos blankets and plugs. Oil remaining in undamaged tanks was transferred to barges using existing cargo piping in the pump room and tanks, bypassing the damaged main deck system. The Brussels had two deck houses, one amidships and the other aft. Their interiors and decks were made of steel. However, stairwells were open from top to bottom, permitting vertical spread of the fire. Internal division bulkheads and paneling were made of combustible composition board. Interiors of both deck houses were virtually consumed by the fire. X marks in the compartments were made by the search parties to indicate the compartment had been checked for victims. A search of both vessels after the fire revealed that of the 16 victims, three persons perished aboard the vessels. The body of the steward was found in the deck house of the Brussels. And the body of the third mate was found below decks in the after storeroom area. The body of a wiper was found in the cross passageway inside the after deck house on the Sea Witch. Aftermath views of the Sea Witch show the deck cargo of containers almost completely consumed. The remains of lifeboats and the scarred hull, especially on the starboard side, reveal the intensity and severity of the fire. The interior of the Sea Witch's two deck houses had steel decks and fire-resistant non-combustible bulkheads, panels, and partitions. The stairwells were also designed to prevent the vertical spread of fire. The Sea Witch suffered several fires in the starboard side interior accommodations and interior spaces. Fire damage inside the after deck house appeared to be most pronounced on the lower decks and along the starboard side. The damage diminished dramatically toward the interior of the vessel and the upper decks. Most corridor bulkheads held and prevented fire from spreading to other spaces. In some cases, bulkheads between staterooms did collapse, permitting the fire to spread to adjacent staterooms. Some fires within the staterooms appear to have been caused by the breaching of the porthole glasses. This allowed radiant heat to ignite draperies and other combustibles. In many staterooms, the drapery fires did not spread to any combustibles and were confined in most cases to the drapes themselves. 
many staterooms, the lounges, and the dining areas, even those adjacent to severely damaged spaces, showed few effects of the fire other than smoke damage and could be made livable by simply washing and cleaning. The emergency generator room, where the electrician took refuge for two hours prior to being rescued, and the electrical equipment show no ill effects. The generator ran for two days following the collision and stopped only when the fuel supply was exhausted. The Marine Board of Investigation determined that steering control failure aboard the Sea Witch was caused by the loss of a 3 16th inch square key in a shaft which transmitted control signals to the steering engine. This key had recently been installed to replace a worn Woodruff key. The key loosened and slipped out of its keyway, allowing the control unit to operate without rotating the differential unit input shaft, making it impossible for the helmsman to control the rudder from the bridge. The location of the failure was such that the transfer of steering control systems on the bridge could not bypass the fault. A trick wheel, or emergency steering wheel, which bypasses normal controls and could have restored the steering, was located in the steering engine room. This station is not normally manned on merchant vessels and was not manned on the morning of the accident. The Sea Witch had previously experienced difficulties with the control shaft and other components of the steering system. When the Sea Witch sailed on 1 June 1973, she was loaded with 1,058 intermodal containers, only one 20-foot container short of a full capacity load. The hull of the Sea Witch was divided into eight transverse watertight compartments, five cargo holds, an engine room, ballast tanks, and a four-peak space. Containers below decks were stored in vertical cell guides, six high and eight wide in the eight forward bays, and three high in the number nine bay. Steel hatch covers were designed to provide a watertight boundary and a platform for above deck container stowage. Above decks, the containers were stacked in bays nine wide and three high on top of the forward hatch covers and two high on the after bay. The containers were held in place by specially designed lashing gear. Typical of containerized freight, contents of the containers varied widely, including, among other things, personal effects, household goods, foodstuffs, automobiles, liquor, wine, books, magazines, boats, and steel wire. Some containers held hazardous materials, flammable liquids and compressed gases, flammable solids, oxidizing materials, or organic peroxides, non-flammable compressed gases, and poisons. Labeled hazardous materials were stowed in accordance with the regulations. The intermodal cargo containers were of three basic constructions, steel, aluminum sheet, and fiberglass reinforced plastic. Most of them had steel frames and wooden floors. They were stowed in a random manner without regard to their materials of construction. Some general statements can be made. All cargo in above deck containers was completely destroyed. Shells of above deck steel containers survive, while those of aluminum and plastic did not. In spite of the extensive damage above decks, steel containers and the steel frames of aluminum and plastic containers remain stacked and lashed in place except for three which were lost overboard. Below decks, the damage sustained was less uniform. Containers and cargoes in some of the top tier container positions suffered extensive damage from heat radiated through the hatch covers. These containers show the range of destruction and typical condition of those stowed below decks. The bottom tiers were water damaged apparently from fire water introduced into the ship, while others were only slightly damaged or stained from smoke. The overall result of this casualty was a loss of 16 lives, 
and property loss approaching $50 million. A large portion of the spilled crude oil was consumed by the ensuing fire. Spilled oil which escaped the fire caused some contamination of nearby shore areas. Every tragedy contains elements which are unique and each provides valuable lessons. In this accident, a steering failure resulted in the loss of control during those moments when a ship was passing near an area where many tank vessels were anchored. Fortunately, the accident affected only two vessels. How different the outcome might have been if the tide and wind conditions had been such as to involve rather than protect nearby ships and port facilities. The required structural fire protection of the Sea Witch afforded her crew a safe haven until rescue forces arrived on scene. This is in dramatic contrast to the deck houses of the SO Brussels, which afforded little refuge from the spread of the fire. The intensity of this casualty undoubtedly was aggravated by the fact that the vessels remained locked together exposing both of them to the intense flames of the spilled oil burning on the water. Now, present fire safety standards are intended to prevent spread of fire within a ship, but do not necessarily guard against exposure to a sudden hostile environment, which can involve a large portion of the vessel. This concept is being re-examined. The Marine Board of Investigation at the outset noted that this was the first catastrophic fire involving a container ship. They recommended that two urgent actions be taken. One was to require immediate examination of other vessels with steering gear similar to that which failed on the Sea Witch. Immediate response by maritime industry revealed that the other vessels were experiencing similar difficulties. Remedial action was undertaken and no further difficulties have been reported. The second recommendation was that all available data and information on the effects of the fire on the containers and their contents be assembled. A joint Coast Guard MARAD working group and the owner surveyors gathered information as the cargo was offloaded. Now results of this survey and the report of the Coast Guard's Marine Board of Investigation will provide valuable information to improve shipboard and import safety. In summary, this accident teaches us that although we have made great strides in the construction of vessels, we cannot be complacent. There is no substitute for vigilance of personnel in the prevention of marine accidents.